with me to the book of Acts. I want to uh, deal with Scripture here. I want to uh, read a verse in chapter number 4, and then uh, verses in chapter 2, 3, and 4 I want to deal with this morning on what God has put in our heart. In Acts chapter number 4, I'll we'll only read one verse because I'm going to read several of these verses in a little while. And, uh, and deal with the issue that the Lord or the, the message that God has given us for today. He said in verse number 10, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by Him doth this man stand here before you whole. I want to preach this morning on the subject, He is risen. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank You for the privilege of being here, for the honor that it is to have the Word of God, to read it freely, and to study it, or to know what the Word of God says. We know there's coming a day, Lord, when the Word of God will not as freely be spoken in America unless You intervene. Lord, there are many that want to shut our doors, they want to shut our Bibles, they want us to quit talking in public about what Christ can do for others. Lord, they want to live their lives the way they will. And Lord, they don't want change, real change. They don't want change that is good. Lord, I pray that You'll help us, Lord, to stand as Christians. Lord, in these days in which we live, and live a resurrected life in Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that now You'll give us understanding, refresh our minds on the Scriptures, those things that You've spoken to us about. And uh, refresh it. And Lord, teach us. Help us to glean from Your Word. We bless You for what You do. And we thank You in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank You. Be seated. Now, I want to deal with the subject, He is risen. And in this subject, we're talking about the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Now, we know and believe that Jesus has resurrected from the grave. You can go and you can look in the tombs of Buddha and uh, of Muhammad and all of those other prophets, everyone's thus far, uh, their grave is found and the bones of their bodies are found in those graves. There's a lot to be said about those things and those are not the issues of the things we want to deal with. But if you go to Joseph's tomb, you find that that tomb is empty. The bones of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ are not there. Why? Because on the third day He resurrected from the dead. Now, I'm not going to deal with the issues of whether he was, uh, whether he died. You know, we've talked about that for many years and looked at different things of, about what, what day was he actually crucified on and uh, could it be possible that he died on Friday and yet stayed three days and three nights in the grave and rose on Sunday. Now, the Bible does say that on the third day he rose from the dead. It didn't say on the fourth day, but it does tell us that the third day he rose from the grave. It doesn't mean that he was actually in the grave 72 hours, but necessarily that he arose on the third day. He died the one day and rose on day three. And so you say, Brother Brown, I did it. Well, that's fine. Go ahead and study it and do what you want to do with it. I'm not going to argue that. But I am here to stand and say it makes no literal difference how long exactly he was in the grave. But it does make a literal difference on the fact that He arose on the third day. That's why we live. That's why we serve a risen Savior. That's why we can be excited and live a resurrected life in Jesus Christ. We're not to live a dead life. We're not to live and give dead offerings and dead sacrifices to God. God said, I'm not interested in sacrifices. I'm not interested in offerings. What I am interested in is obedience. And the Bible said that He gave His life that we might live in a different life. We might walk in the, as the Bible tells us, in the newness of life, which is a resurrected life. We're not to live as we lived before, being dead to God and alive to sin, but we're to live a life that is dead to sin and alive unto God. That's what our life is to be. Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Now believe this. It's not the abundant life that Joel Osteen preaches about that Jesus said that because He gave you abundant life that you're going to have riches and fame and popularity and you'll have everything that you ever wanted and all this. That's not what the Bible teaches us. The Bible said that the abundant life is that life that Christ gives you in your heart. You can be a person that has nothing as far as monetary gain, 
but you're the richest person on the earth. Why? Because you have Christ living in you. That is the abundant life. A life that says no matter what happens to me, no matter what I go through, no matter what I face, I am alive in Jesus Christ and I will Amen. live forever. And the Bible teaches me that I have the unsearchable riches of Christ. Amen? At my disposal. I don't want fortune and fame. I don't need all of that. What I want is to be a witness for Christ and a light in a dark world to be just a light in somebody's life that they might see Christ and realize that they need Him as their Savior. Now, we serve a risen Savior. The Bible says in that verse, He said, This Jesus Christ whom they crucified, God raised from the dead. I want to show you something important. Go with me to chapter number 2. In the book of Acts, chapter number 2. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 14, but I want to say some things about the ver verses 1 through 13. Now, we know that verses 1 through 13 deals with the day of Pentecost. It deals with the day that the Holy Spirit, which was the promise that was given by the Father, had finally arrived, which was ten days after Jesus Christ left, when He told Peter... He said, go and wait for the promise of the Father. Ten days later, the Spirit of God comes down. And the Spirit of God shows Himself, the Bible says, as a cloven tongue of fire on the head of everyone that spoke in tongues. And the Bible said it filled them that were in the room and they spoke in other tongues. Now, He didn't say He spoke in unknown tongues. He didn't say that they spoke in undistinguishable tongues. But the Bible gives us 17 languages from verse 9 to verse 9 number uh, uh, 11, through verse number 11, 17 languages that they spoke in. Now, the Bible doesn't say that any of those spoke in a tongue that nobody could distinguish. There was a reason for this. There were at least 17 different people or tongues of people that re were represented in that room that night when they began to speak. Now, here in Acts chapter number 2, and, and you look at this, and the Bible said, look at verse number 13. I want to start here. The Bible said that there were those, well, look at verse 12. They were all amazed and were in doubt, <coughs> saying one to another, what meaneth this? Now, verse number 11 says that the 17 different languages of people all said the same thing. They said, wait a minute. Are not these men Galileans yet... They all speak in our tongue the wonderful works of God. Now, if somebody speaks in tongues, it means that somebody's going to understand what they're saying because they're going to be speaking in the language that that person knows. Never do you find in the Bible that anyone spoke in a tongue that was undistinguishable that nobody could understand. The Bible tells us if anybody speaks in tongues, it has to be at at least two, no more than three. Now, that's what the Bible tells us. Now, some people ain't going to agree with that. They don't like it because they want everybody to speak in tongues. And, and so we're not going to get into all that. But look at what the Bible says. Seventeen different nationalities of people all heard them speak in their own language. Others said, the ones that, when I heard them in my language, I didn't understand that language he was speaking, that other guy did. But then everybody was saying, this is, we don't understand this. Well, maybe, according to verse 13, maybe they're all drunk with wine. I want you to notice it. You remember Peter, earlier in the Bible? The Bible says that he denied the Lord three times. Three times he was asked, are you not with him? No, I wasn't me. And the Bible says one time he cursed. And he told him, no, I wasn't with them. I'm not one of his disciples. He didn't want to be numbered with them for a moment. Three times the Bible said, Jesus told him, before the cock will crow, you're going to deny me three times. Well, you know, Peter was bold. You know, when they first come to arrest uh, Jesus, Peter pulled out his sword and warned, buddy, I'll tell you what, he cut off that dude's ear. He wasn't aiming for his ear, he was aiming for his neck. He was going to kill him. Thank God uh, an angel or whatever knocked that sword and made him cut off his ear. And the Bible said Jesus picked up his ear and put it back and healed it instantly. I'd like to see that happen on some of these TV programs where these healers are doing that. Let me see something instant, dude. Cut off somebody's ear and put it back on. Then I might believe you. But 
You know, everything they heal is something you can't see and the doctor can't verify either. It's all got to be some hidden thing. They all are in it as far as the money. It's not about it's not about healing. It's not about reality. It's not about God blessing somebody. You know, when God heals somebody, God gets the glory, not any man. That's the difference in scriptural healing and what we see on this healing TVs today. That's what's going on. They're just healing you. They're, they're taking all that corrupt money out of your pocket. That's what they're doing. And, and they're healing your pocket from having evil things in it. That's what they look at. But look at verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them. Now you see, Peter was bold. Peter, Peter was loud. He was boisterous. He wasn't afraid to say stuff. The problem is, is when he was counted with the disciples of Jesus, he said, no, that wasn't me. He was quick to say it wasn't him. But you know what? Now, he comes to the defense of his fellow brethren. When he realizes that these people were mocking and saying, hey, they're just a bunch of God. They're, they're men that are full of new wine. They're just drunk. Peter said, hold up a second here. I may have denied my Savior three times like he said I would, but I've got to say something here. You know, there's something about being a Christian. When it comes down to where your back is against the wall and you say, well, Brother Brown, I just don't know if I would be able to say anything if somebody walked up to me and said something. I just don't know if I'd be able to say it. When the Holy Spirit backs you up against the wall, you got nowhere else to go. You're going to speak up. Sometimes, sad to say, that's the only time that we do speak up. God has to.